I want to stand with you and agree with you for your breakthrough today. I want to pray for you before I speak and preach. I want to pray and activate God's power in your life. Father, thank you for your anointing. Thank you for your blessing. Thank you for the breakthroughs that everyone is believing for each and every breakthrough that they need a breakthrough in their in their soul, a breakthrough in their health, a breakthrough in their finances, a breakthrough in their family. You are the God of the breakthrough and we call on you and we thank you for your power working in every person's life today in Jesus name. Amen. Well, I want to get into God's word with you right now. And the title of this teaching is simply called Put Your Clothes On. It's not going to be what you think, but it's kind of funny. Put your clothes on. I'm going to show you what to clothe yourself with. Revelation chapter three, verse 17 and 18. It says this. Jesus said, because you say I'm rich and I have become wealthy and I have need of nothing. He says, but you do not know that you're miserable, poor, blind and naked. Not real encouraging words right there in verse 17, but it gets better. He said in verse 18, so I advise you, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire that you may be rich and white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. Notice what Jesus wants for each and every one of us. He says that you may be rich. And of course, that's riches that money can't buy. He's talking about spiritual and true riches, the presence of God. Then he says so that you may be rich. Number two, that you may be clothed. God wants you to truly be clothed with what he has for you and that you may see true riches are being refined by fire to have faith in God and the faith of God to stay with it, even through the trials and tribulations of life, to have what Jesus truly values. True clothes are those that have been washed as white as snow. And we'll come back to this in a moment. And true sight is that you might see through the lens of heaven's point of view to see things from God's point of view. But I want to talk to you specifically about being clothed with these white garments. Now, there are three things in scripture that God tells us to be clothed with throughout the word of God. And I want to make sure that we together, you and I wrap our minds, our hearts, wrap our thinking, wrap our entire being with these three things. He tells us to be clothed with these three things. Are you ready for these? Number one, we're to be clothed in righteousness. Isaiah chapter 61 verse two and three or verse 10, actually, in the New American Standard Bible, I will rejoice greatly in the Lord. My soul will be joyful in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation. He has wrapped me with a robe of righteousness as a groom puts on a turban and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. So the first thing God tells us to be clothed with and the first thing that God gives to us when we are born again is he gives us the gift of righteousness. Now, righteousness is the gift of right standing with God. It's the gift of royalty in God and it's the gift of reigning with God. I want to say that again. Righteousness is the gift of being put in right standing with God to have a right relationship, to be able to to stand before God without guilt and to stand before any enemy in your life without shame, fear or inferiority. So it's right standing with God. It's royalty in God and it's reigning with God. I love what he says in Isaiah chapter 61, verse two and three in the Passion Translation, he says, I am sent. Jesus said, I am sent to announce a new season of Yahweh's grace and a time of God's recompense on his enemies to comfort all who are in sorrow, to strengthen those that are crushed by despair with those who mourn in sorrow. And he says in Zion and to give them a beautiful bouquet in the place of ashes, the oil of gladness or the oil of bliss and happiness instead of tears and the mantle of joy and praise instead of the spirit of heaviness. And then he closes this verse with because of this, they will be known as mighty oaks of righteousness 
planted by Yahweh as a living display of his glory. How do we become these oaks of righteousness? God says that he will make us oaks of righteousness. How do we become that? We are made that by God. You can't make yourself an oak of righteousness. God makes you an oak of righteousness. How does he do that? Romans chapter five, verse 17 says through the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness, we reign in life. And like I shared with you, maybe last time we were together, the reason so many Christians are not reigning in life is because they don't understand the abundance of grace or they don't understand the gift of righteousness. Righteousness is not something that we do. It is something that we are. It's our identity in Christ. And when you understand your identity, you'll start doing things that line up with that identity. You're royalty in Christ. You're the righteousness of God. If you've been born again in second Corinthians, chapter five, verse 21, he says, God made him Jesus who knew no sin to become sin for us that we would become or that we would be made the righteousness of God. Wow, what a gift, what an exchange. He becomes sin and he makes us to become righteous and in right standing with God, royalty of God and reigning with God. So number one, we need to remember that in Christ we are clothed with righteousness inside and out. We're clothed with righteousness inside and out. So I said at the beginning, put your clothes on, right? <laughs> Get your clothes on. The first piece of clothing that we need to have is the gift of righteousness or to be wrapped in his righteousness. And that is a gift. Simply receive that. Simply realize that it's yours when you're born again and begin to acknowledge that and begin to speak that you are the righteousness of God. Number two, we're to be clothed with power from on high. So God clothes us with his righteousness and God clothes us, us with power from on high. Now, it's so important that we face this life. Nobody gets up and goes out to work without putting their clothes on. Nobody goes to the gym without putting gym clothes on. Nobody goes to work without putting some sort of work clothes on. Yet so many believers are going out to live out their victory and live out their spiritual warfare without recognizing and realizing how they need to be clothed. Now, we don't have to become righteous again, but we need to recognize and put that breastplate back on and realize we're the righteousness of God and we need to face our life knowing that we're clothed with righteousness. Number two, knowing that we're clothed with power from on high in Luke chapter 24. After Jesus rose from the dead, he said, behold, in verse 49, he said, behold, I'm sending the promise of my father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Boy, these are good clothes we're talking about. These are not bad clothes. These are the best clothes clothed in righteousness and clothed with power from on high. What is this power Jesus speaks of? Well, it is none other than the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus is speaking of the baptism of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter one, verse five. Listen to this power that you can have access to. Jesus said in Acts chapter one, verse five, for John baptized with water, but you shall be baptized in the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And in Acts chapter one, verse eight, he goes on to say, stop trying to figure out when the end is going to be in verse seven. He says, stop trying to trying to figure out the timing and the end and when Jesus is coming back. He said, stop trying to figure all that out. Instead, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, verse eight. And then he says, you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria and to the remotest parts of the earth. Now, I want you to understand when he when he describes these regions, he's talking about a geographical region that spreads out like this, like a like if you throw a rock into water and the ripples begin to go like that. That's what he's talking about. Jerusalem, then Judea and Samaria 
and the ends of the earth. In other words, the power of the Holy Spirit will give you power to impact the whole world when you decide you're going to make an impact right where you are. Jerusalem was right there where they were. But Jesus was saying the power of the Holy Spirit is going to cause you to make an impact right where you are and then have a ripple effect to the ends of the earth. Wow. You don't want to you don't want to leave home without this clothing on. You don't want to leave home without these clothes to be clothed with power from on high. And when did this happen? It happened for the apostles in Acts chapter two, verse one. And this is available to you. I'll show you that in a moment. But in Acts chapter two, verse one, it says when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one mind and one accord in one place. That tells you something about how we need to be as believers. We need to be of one mind. We need to be of one accord. We need to be in one place. We're supposed to gather together. The Bible says don't forsake the assembling together. We're assembling together every time here at Life Changers International Church, both in person and online. But we're supposed to come with one accord in one place. And it says suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a mighty rushing wind and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And what does it say? It says and there appeared to them tongues of fire that sat upon each one of them. And it says in verse four, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, not just the apostles, but all the other believers that were there about 120. We find out later. But he says they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the spirit gave them utterance. This gift of speaking in tongues was a part of them being clothed with power from on high. Boy, when you have this gift to be able to pray in this heavenly language, it's something where you have this hotline directly to God. This is a gift that we should be clothed with. This is a gift that we need to face our life with. We're supposed to face life with the clothing of power. We're supposed to face our problems with power. We're supposed to face our enemies. And I mean, spiritual enemies, the devil and demonic forces. And, and doubts and fears and anxiety You're supposed to face those things with power. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but power, love and a sound mind. And where does that power come from? The power of the Holy Spirit. Now we're going to drill down more on the power of the Holy Spirit at another service sometime. But Jesus said, how do you get this power in Luke chapter 11, verse 13? Jesus said something very powerful. He said, if you guys, if you fathers being evil, you still know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? All it takes for us to receive this power from on high is to ask the father. In fact, why don't we just ask him right now before I get to the third thing we're going to be clothed with? Let's ask him right now, right where you're sitting, right where you're standing, right where you're experiencing this moment. Let's ask the father. Let's go to him and pray together. Just say this heavenly father, I am already saved by the blood of Jesus. And now I'm asking you to clothe me with the Holy Spirit, clothe me with the power of the Holy Spirit. You said say this, pray this out loud with me, say Heavenly Father, you said if I asked you for the Holy Spirit, you would give him to me. If I asked you, you would freely give him to me. I ask you for the Holy Spirit and the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and I receive him now in Jesus name. Amen. Now, there's a book that I have before I get to my third point and final point. There's a book that I have called the power of a new life. And in this chapter is in this book is a whole chapter on the power of the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Download this right where you are anywhere for free. It's absolutely my gift to you. And it will show you how to speak forth and how to bring forth these this precious gift of the power of the Holy Spirit. So now, number one, we're to be clothed with righteousness, which God clothes us with through the blood of Jesus. Number two, we're to be clothed with power from on high. Now, these first two things that we need to 
put our clothes on, these first two garments of clothing are two things that God clothes us with. He clothes us with righteousness and he clothes us with the power of the Holy Spirit. But the third thing that we're clothed with, the third thing is something that we must clothe ourselves with. And in fact, it's not going to be new to you because I've been talking about it for the last several weeks. But this third thing is our responsibility to clothe ourselves with this. In first Peter, chapter five, verse five, he says, you younger men, listen to what he says. He says, you younger men, likewise, be subject to your elders. But then he says, but all of you, which includes young and old men and women, boys and girls, he says, all of you clothe yourselves with humility towards one another, for God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Notice he says all of you, all of you, whether we're the younger or whether we're the older, whether we're the whether we're the men, whether we're the women, all of you, whether we're the husband or the wife, all of you, whether we're the parent or the child, all of you, whether you're the pastor or the sheep, all of you clothe yourselves with humility towards one another. We all have the responsibility to be humble and to clothe ourselves with humility. Nobody can do your humbling for you. It's something you got to do that for yourself. You can't like delegate it, like go humble yourself on my behalf. No, you have to humble yourself on your own behalf. Now, listen, what is humility? We talked about this, but I'm giving you some new definitions today. Humility is not denying the power that you have, but it's admitting that the power comes from God and not from you. Humility doesn't mean not having these clothings. Humility means that knowing that it all comes from God. Humility doesn't mean that we we live in poverty. It means that we trust God to supply all of our needs according to his riches and glory. Humility is simply depending fully on God. It's not if we deny the power we've been given, we're really lying. Um, if we've been given a talent for uh, business, if we've been given a talent for making money, if we've been given a talent to be able to sing, these are all talents. Then we should be using them as good stewards for the glory of God. If your talent is in administration, you should be using it to help things happen consistently in God's kingdom. My point is, is that when you realize that whatever you have came from God and you're depending on God, you'll use your gifts for his glory and to serve other people. But when you think it belongs to you, when you think it's from you, when you think that all the goodness in your life originated from you, then you'll you'll use it to usually serve yourself. But when you realize that it's from God, everything good you have is from God. It causes you to have humility depending on God and it ends up causing you to be generous with your gifts, with your talent, with your time, because you realize it all comes from God. Humility is rooted in the word gentleness and that word gentleness in the Bible Listen to what it means. It means to avoid unnecessary harshness. In other words, don't be harsh with people. Humility is being gentle. It means refusing to be harsh, avoiding unnecessary harshness. If you have to defend your child because somebody's trying to hurt them or defend your friend because somebody's trying to hurt them, then you, you need to use harshness in those situations. But gentleness is avoiding unnecessary harshness yet without compromising or being too slow to use necessary force if it's needed. So it's never something that we can accomplish. Humility and gentleness is something that we need to rely on from God. It's the fruit of, of the spirit. It's something that God gives us. And it's something that God makes us if we're humble and we're open to it, letting him make us gentle, letting him make us gentle is it's controlled strength, meekness, humility. It's having strength, but only using it when necessary, not using it to hurt others, except in the defense of the innocent or the weak. OK, so humility. Also, there are false religions that tell us to deny ourselves. And we need to
be dead to self, but we can't just be dead to self without being alive to God. So humility is a balance of not just denying self, but it's also making sure Jesus is on the throne of our lives. True humility is not hating yourself. It's not hating your accomplishments. It's not hating your talents. It's not diminishing what God has given you, but it's being aware that all of it comes from God. It's being aware that every good thing that you have comes from him. Humility makes you thankful. It makes you grateful. Only a person who is depending on God and acknowledging God. Only then are we truly operating in humility. In Proverbs chapter 13, there's a powerful verse. It says only by pride comes contention. That word contention is also the word strife. So this verse makes it clear that pride is the source of all strife. When you have strife in your home, when you have strife in your business, when you have strife in relationships somewhere, there's pride involved because when there's humility, strife disappears. I know that a lot of people it's not easy to hear, but we have to realize that it's not our circumstances or the personalities involved in our situations that cause us strife. It's pride. Pride is not the leading cause of strife and contention. It's the only cause of strife and contention. All strife, all strife, all harshness towards others. It comes from pride. All this wanting to fight and prove that you're right. That's pride. Pride is like a stick. It has two ends. But most clearly, most people can clearly see the part that represents arrogance, but they can't see the, the other part, which is low self esteem is not is not humility. That's pride. Also, false humility is pride being shy and afraid to trust God, to speak God's word. That's pride. Also, sometimes it's not the big things that God wants us to do or asks of us, but it's the little things. I think this scripture in Second Kings really illustrates this. There was this great general right in Second Kings chapter five. Remember, there was this great general and which tells us something, no matter how great we are in this world, we need God. And this guy ended up with leprosy. And after speaking of this great and mighty commander in chief, the scripture tells us and speaks of this little girl that had to share with him how to humble himself and how to experience healing for his leprosy. In verse 11, his servant said, after he hearing from this little girl, uh, the servant said, uh, you have to dip yourself in the river Jordan seven times to be healed of leprosy. And the Bible says in verse 11 that he went away angry and he said, I thought that he would ask me to do something great. I thought he would ask me to dip in the holy rivers. Why would he ask me to dip in in this dirty river Jordan? He went to, he went away angry because he was he thought to himself he was his thoughts mattered more to him than what God thought. Pride is all about what we think over what God thinks. When we make emotional decisions, when we make bad decisions, it's because we're putting our thoughts above God's thoughts. Pride is to exalt our opinion over God's opinion. You know, God has an opinion of how to handle your your mouth, your words. God has an opinion of how to relate to one another in a relationship. God has an opinion about what to do with our money. When we put our opinion above God's opinion, that's pride. When we get we and pride causes us to get angry when God's way of doing things doesn't match our way of doing things. Wow. It really is something when we realize humility is being willing to do it God's way, even if it doesn't make sense to us, because this great general said, 
Why can't I dip in my own river? Why can't I have my own opinion? Why can't I do it my way? Why can't I be healed and saved or blessed my way? Hey, listen, should the sick person dictate how the doctor should treat him? We're the ones that are sick and God is our doctor. And if we don't follow his prescription, we shouldn't be wondering why we're failing to recover from our quote unquote sickness, whatever that is. So, so often we we learn we, we hold on to our earthly power. When he said, can I can I wash in the Damascus River? Because Damascus represented great power and God didn't want him to dip himself in great power. He wanted him to dip himself in great humility. He wanted him to trust in God's power, not man's power. Boy, we could just go on and on about this. He went on to tell him, you have to dip in the River Jordan seven times. Why seven times? Because seven represents a process until it's complete. Seven represents not dipping in the river once, because sometimes we just want to do it God's way once. But God tells him to do it this way seven times. It's a process of getting over self. It's trusting God when nothing happens the first time. Humility is trusting God when nothing happens the second time. Humility is trusting God when nothing happens the third time. Well, I keep speaking God's word or I keep going to church or I keep lifting my hands. And why isn't it happening? Why isn't my miracle happening? Because God wants to get your mind off of what you're doing to make it happen. And he wants you to learn a lifestyle of worship, a lifestyle of dipping in the river, Jordan, a lifestyle of speaking God's word, a lifestyle of trusting God, a lifestyle of depending on God. Whew. Why seven times? Because seven represents the number of completion. So often we want to do things our way and it when we do it our way, it's left incomplete. When we do things God's way, it will always be complete. It will always complete you. You'll finally be complete when you do things God's way, not man's way. Boy, humility is really simple. It's depending on God and it's doing things God's way, even when we have a different opinion. Humility is to receive God's word. And trust God's word, no matter what it looks like. Humility is to walk in God's power, yet with gentleness towards people not using our power to control people, not using our power to to shame people, not using our power to belittle people and be condescending and make them feel less than. But it's using our power to lift people up. It's using our power, realizing our power comes from God and then using that power to serve others. You know, the best, most humble thing you can do is make yourself the person that you admire most and give yourself as a servant to this world. Give yourself as a servant in your church family. Give yourself as a servant to your family members. Give yourself as a servant to God. It doesn't it's not what makes God happy. It will make you happy when you're a servant, though, and will serving others will fulfill you. Serving others will satisfy you. Serving others will advance God's purposes and God's kingdom. Jesus said the greatest among you should be the servant of all. That doesn't mean that we should serve so that we can become great. Jesus is saying when you when you really understand the greatness that God has put inside of you, you will use that to serve others and you no longer feel inferior by doing something minor or dipping in the River Jordan or cleaning up the you know, sweeping the floor. It won't humiliate you when you have humility. It will only humiliate you when you have pride. Being a servant and doing the, the thing that nobody else wants to do. Often that's humility. We often think 
that to do something great for God is to do something that everybody looks at and says, how great is that? But as far as God's concerned, it's the things we do in secret. It's the things we do for others without trying to get something back, without trying to look better to other people. That's humility. It's to serve without needing man's recognition, without needing people's approval, but to serve because you trust God and you realize that whatever you have that's good, it came from him. Come on, let's pray together and ask God to anoint our eyes to truly see this. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you are with us. I thank you that you will reveal to every person the power of humility, the power of being clothed with righteousness, clothed with power from on high and clothing ourselves with humility. I pray for eyes to see, ears to hear and hearts to feel the heartbeat of Jesus and you, Heavenly Father. Now I'm asking if you're watching right now and you have never accepted Jesus as your savior, pray this with me. Just pray this and invite him into your life. Don't let this moment pass. Don't let this day go by without you accepting Jesus. Pray this out loud. Say, Heavenly Father, I invite Jesus Christ into my life as my savior. I believe say that out loud. I believe Jesus died for my sins and rose from the dead. Say that out loud from this day forward. I'm a child of God in Jesus name. Amen. Congratulations. If you prayed that prayer, you made the greatest decision of your life. You just clothed yourself with humility by accepting God's gift of salvation rather than thinking that you can save yourself. Only he can save us. And that's the first act of humility of all is to realize we can't save ourselves, but we can receive his gift of salvation by his grace. Thank you so much for taking the time to connect with me at Life Changers Church. And I want to encourage you get the book, The Power of a New Life. You can download this if you prayed this prayer or you prayed to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Get this book absolutely free for me. Download it anywhere in the world. The Power of a New Life. God bless you. I love you. I can't wait to see you at our next service. God bless.